This is Ryzen 5 7500F and his direct competitor from Intel i5-12400. It's actually very common knowledge that Ryzen is just a better CPU than the i5-12400. But here's the question, what if we overclock the 12400 to 5GHz, can it actually now compete with Ryzen? Are they gonna become equals or i5 will just beat the Ryzen? I was wondering myself for quite some time, so in this video we will overclock the i5 using this ASRock motherboard that is capable of 12 gen BCLK overclocking and see can it actually compete now with Ryzen 5. And to make sure we're not GPU bottlenecked we will use this Radeon 6900 XTX. We will test them in Full HD resolution in multiple games and see which CPU is better and how far are they from the stock i5. And I will also use this opportunity to tell you more about the hardware I'm using. Let's go! Let's begin with explaining under what circumstances can you overclock a non-K 12th gen CPU. And the answer is rather simple. You need a special motherboard that has an external BCLK generator. And the list is rather short, there's like 20 motherboards and affordable are like 3 or 4 of them. All others are top of the line overclocking motherboards. If your motherboard is not on the list then don't bother, it's just incapable of overclocking a non-K 12th gen CPU. And I'm putting the emphasis on 12th gen, there's no overclocking for 13th and 14th gen. In my case it's ASRock B760M PG Riptide, probably the cheapest DDR5 motherboard for this kind of job. On the other side we're also gonna use this ASRock B650 affordable motherboard, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later. But let's first discuss the Riptide because I think it's a great motherboard that has issues but overall it's really good. It has dual M.2 slots that's running 4.0 an M.2 Wi-Fi slot, an X16 4.0 slot, an X1 4.0 slot, and four SATA ports, which is more than enough for most people. It has a very cheap integrated sound card, ALC897, but it's fine. There's a port you can put a discrete one in. On the back panel, there are four USB 5 gigabit ports, one of them is Type-C, four USB 2 ports, two video outputs, two and a half gigabit ethernet, and antenna ports. The most important part of this motherboard is the VRM, which is actually quite capable VRM. It can run basically any CPU you throw in, including 14900K. The hardware underneath this rather decent radiator is 14 power stages combined into 7 phases. And it's powered by this 8 plus 4 pin CPU power connector. But unless you're gonna plug in a 14900K, there's no need for an extra 4 pin. 8 is more than enough. Overall, this is a very capable little motherboard and the price, well, the price fluctuates depending on the region you are in. In my case, during the Christmas sale, I got it around 125 US dollars new, which I think was a steal for this motherboard. But this motherboard is not perfect. It actually has issues that we're gonna discuss during this video. For instance, it suffers from dual cold start. But let's talk about Ryzen. In our case it's Ryzen 5 7500F and this very affordable ASRock B650M-H-M.2+. It's very affordable and I got it around $90 during the Chinese New Year sale on AliExpress. And for that kind of money it's amazing. It also has dual M.2 but one of them is actually 5.0. Try getting that on an Intel board that is like cheaper than $250. It has an M.2 Wi-Fi slot, a dual X1 4.0 slots and four SATA ports. Thank you for the M.2 Astrock, I really appreciate it. The back panel is very simple, there's four 5 gigabit USB ports, one of them is Type-C, dual USB 2 ports, dual video outputs and outputs of the ALC897 integrated sound. The CPU power delivery is 650 amp phases that are covered by a, well, rather small radiator. This board also has some power limitations for high-end CPUs. For the video card we're gonna use the 7900 XDX from Gigabyte. It's the Gigabyte ARS Elite, the high-end version, with huge radiator and a vapor chamber. This thing is just massive and a subscriber gave it to me for a week so I can make this video. Thank you. 
It has three 8-pin power pins, a dual bias, and, well, it's just big. It's, it's ridiculously big. You will need quite a big case to put this one in, but there are much cheaper and more affordable 7900 XDX versions. This one is just, well, top of the line one, and you don't always need to buy this one, but honestly this one is really good and it's really cold, the temperatures are great. For the RAM I'm gonna use Patriot Viper Extreme 5 8000 MHz RAM kit. This is an overkill for such a system, you should use this kind of kit on something like Apex or Tachyon, but I just have it and I'm gonna manage overclock this RAM kit to the best suitable frequency for each of these CPU which is nowhere near 8000 megahertz. You probably already guessed that we're gonna run i5-12400 in two modes. One of them is stock but the RAM is gonna be overclocked and the second one is overclocked CPU with overclocked RAM. As for 7500F, I've overclocked it 200 MHz using the PBO, I also undervolted it and the RAM is gonna be set to 6200 with improved timings. And before we begin, please subscribe to the channel, it's so hard to get 1k subs and I'm trying to deliver good quality content here. The B650 motherboard from ASRock has a few weird settings by default, but they are easily configurable. The board has really nice manual presets for average users, but you can also overclock the CPU using voltage and frequency. However, there is nothing in the AMD overclocking in the Precision Boost Overdrive menu. There should be an advanced menu here, but it's just disabled. It's inconvenient and I guess ASRock differentiates this board using this method. It's like get a better board if you want full capabilities, but you can always just use Ryzen Master. It's not disabled in any way. In my case, I just applied 200 MHz overclock from the Ryzen Master. The RAM was manually overclocked for both CPUs. On the left is i5 and on the right is Ryzen. Feel free to pause and comment on my overclocking capabilities. But I think it's good enough for both CPUs and really allows us to use their full potential. One thing to note about the i5 is that the BCLK is kind of flowing for the CPU. The board seems to fluctuate the BCLK between 124 and 126. Just doesn't like 125 BCLK. Also know that ADA versions for AMD and Intel is a little different, but these are for your reference only, so you can understand in general what kind of RAM speeds can you expect from such overclocks. Some motherboards like MSI Z790i Edge are capable of running even higher speeds for 12400, like you can actually reach something like close to 7000 MHz on an i5-12400 if you're very lucky. Reaching high memory speeds on non-K CPUs is very hard due to system agent voltage being locked. So in our case, it's 7200 MHz, or a little less or more, depending on how the BCLK behaves. And let's begin our tests with Cinebench R23. And as you can see, in single core performance, the stock 12400K is actually very far away from Ryzen 5. But when overclocked to 5 GHz, it's actually capable of beating the Ryzen 5. Please note that Ryzen 5 in most cases is capable of overclocking to 5.4 GHz. So single core performance is close. But in multi-core tests, Ryzen actually falls behind 1000 points. That's probably because I overclocked it using the PBO and not manually setting the frequency. With manual 5.4, these CPUs would probably be equal in terms of multi-core. Please note that stock Ryzen 5 7500F would show worse results. In Cinebench 2024, Ryzen 5 and i5 overclocked have very similar single core performance, and they are both 17% faster than the 12400 in stock. Overclocking really does wonders for single core performance. As for the multi-core performance, both CPUs are again very equal to each other. The result in this test is actually a lot closer than the Cinebench R23. The stock i5 is 29% slower than the overclocked i5 in Ryzen. Please note that in stock, Ryzen's result would be lower. Now let's get to games. Assassin's Creed Mirage, Full HD, Ultra Settings. Stock i5 on the left, overclocked in the middle, and Ryzen on the right. I also had some weird fonts problem on my Ryzen test bench, sorry it's gonna look a little different than the other two tables. And in this game, the overclocked i5 can actually beat Ryzen, though by a very low margin, but it's still a victory. 
the stock i5 shows very decent performance, but it's nowhere near the Ryzen or the overclocked i5. So whenever I see a video where stock 12400 for some weird reason is equal to Ryzen 5, I just call BS on that. Ryzen 5 is just a substantially faster CPU than the i5-12400. It's also important to use the right RAM for Ryzen because it's very RAM dependent. Do not ever buy DDR5 8GB memory sticks because they very much cripple the performance of your Ryzen or Intel CPU. Next game is Far Cry 6 and here i5-12400 overclocked actually wins. The average FPS between Ryzen and overclocked i5 is basically the same, but 1% lows are very much in favor of Intel. The difference is almost 20% and 1% lows are very important. Though you would get very, very great game experience on all of these CPUs. But if I have a 144Hz monitor, I would definitely prefer to have frame consistency. So a clear win for the i5 overclocked, but well, it's not a very huge win, but still. Next is Hogwarts Legacy. And here we see the same picture like in Far Cry 6. The overclocked i5 and Ryzen are very close in terms of average FPS, but 1% lows for the overclocked i5 are just better. Frame time consistency is very important, especially in Hogwarts Legacy since it's not a very greatly optimized game. The stock i5 actually provides, well, very decent frame rates, but it's nowhere near the performance of the overclocked i5 and Ryzen 5. But it would be more than sufficient for something like RTX 4070 or 7800 XT. I think the overclocked i5 deserves a win in this game. Next is Baldur's Gate 3, and you should really play this game. It's amazing, I love it. And in this game, the performance of the overclocked i5 and Ryzen 5 is, well, it's very much equal. Yes, the i5 is, well, a few percent faster, but overall the game is very much the same on both of these CPUs. And the stock i5 is 10 to 15% behind both of these CPUs. But bear in mind this, in Full HD resolution the CPU performance is the limitation and all of these CPUs are incapable of fully utilizing the 7900XTX. As you can see the GPU usage is around 60-70%. to 70%. Next is Cyberpunk 2077 and in here, well, the Ryzen just is not capable of beating even the i5 stock. I found that very weird and I had to double check the settings, redo the tests and for some reason the i5 is just better, even in stock. I think this game is just good with Intel and just nicely utilizes all the cores and that's why we see the performance difference. Next is Counter-Strike 2 and all of these CPUs have ridiculous frame rates but still the overclocked i5 is just a little better in terms of 1% lows and Ryzen is better in terms of average FPS. I guess we can call the overclocked i5 a winner here but considering the ridiculous FPS it's, it's a very minor victory. And as always all of these CPUs fail to utilize the GPU at 100%. Next is Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, built on Benchmark, and here the Ryzen 5 is a clear winner, though not by a huge margin, but still a clear winner. And the stock i5 is not very far away from the overclocked i5 and Ryzen 5. And amazingly, GPU utilization in this game is close to 100%, so a small victory for the Ryzen 5 in this game. Now let's see a few games if we crank up the resolution to 2K and 4K. And sorry in advance, it's my native language, I forgot to switch to English. Far Cry 6 2K, we can see that stock i5 is just not capable even in higher resolution to deliver the same FPS as the other two CPUs. And even in 4K, it's a little bit slower than the other two. But we can see the GPU is definitely beginning to be a bottleneck here. As always, the higher the resolution, the more GPU usage, the less CPU usage. Assassin's Creed Mirage is a lot better at CPU utilization, so the performance difference even in 2K is very minor. So we're a little CPU bottleneck in terms of i5 stock, but still we're pretty good. And in 4K, all CPUs are very much equal to each other in average FPS and 1% lows. So I guess Captain Obvious to the rescue, in 4K you don't need a great CPU? Well, we already know that. So, what conclusions can we make? An overclocked i5 is a worthy opponent for the Ryzen 7500F, and in many games it even runs better than the Ryzen, but considering very poor motherboard choice, I don't think it's just worth it. 
and as for the stock 12400, it's actually a very capable CPU delivering enough performance to fully saturate your RTX 4070 or something like 7800 XT. I think 12 gen overclocking is for the enthusiasts that really know what they're doing. An average consumer should stick to 12400 for an ordinary build or Ryzen 5 7500F if you want something beefier. And I will say it again, you need a special motherboard to overclock this CPU. It's not going to be overclockable in any board. No need to ask in the comments if your board is capable of doing that if it's not on the list. The answer is just no. So I think you should just do this. If you have a very decent budget for your build, get a Ryzen 5 7500F. This CPU is great, it offers amazing performance and you do not need an expensive motherboard to run it at its full capabilities. Just don't forget a decent RAM kit for it, no 8 gig sticks. As for the 12400, it's also a great CPU, but it's in a lower budget. You can get an H610 motherboard with a DDR4-3200 kit. It would be a lot less expensive than Ryzen, but still would be capable of running something like RTX 4060 or 7600 XT. You can go for the overclocked i5 if you're an enthusiast and you can get a board for cheap. I had a lot of fun making this video and please subscribe to the channel. Getting subscribers is so hard when your channel is this small. Please subscribe, it's free, it's nothing for you.